So I would like to thank you for joining us uh, at this panel, another very important panel on a critical topic of the industry and also an area where Cyprus has put uh, forward a number of significant proposals and initiatives. It is a panel on fostering environmental sustainability, green initiatives, and we're gonna talk about the global regulatory system uh, and about the market uh, developments, uh, taxation schemes, and so on. We're, we're delighted to have with us uh, Stamatis Fradellos from DNV, who is going to be the uh, moderator of this panel. And of course, uh, Stamati, maybe I will let you introduce the panelists. I'd like to say thank you to you and uh, a very big thank you to Harris, Philippos, Lucas, and uh, Ioannis. And I will let you take over and guide us through the, uh, the panel. Uh, Nicola, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all. And uh, thank you for uh, investing your time with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, as Nicola has mentioned, my name is Tamatis Fradelos. I'm uh, the Regional Bulk Areas Director for TNP, and I will coordinate this uh, panel discussion. Today is the last day of MPC 76 meeting where important uh, new regulations are going to be adopted. And uh, we have a great uh, panel from industry experts uh, by shipping companies and uh, the Cyprus Flag Administration where we will be talking about the important uh, regulatory de development and big trends that we need to keep our eyes on that uh, could di directly impact our business. So without losing uh, more time, I will take a few moments to introduce our panelists and then I will straight kick off the conversation asking questions that draw out some of the high level themes and trends we should be thinking about. So I'm pleased to have today with us uh, Mr. Ioannis Estratiou, Head of Marine Environment Unit, Shipping Deputy Ministry, Republic of Cyprus. Mr. Philippos Philis, or Philis in Greek, uh, Chairman and CEO, Le Misolaire Navigation, uh, President Elected European Community Ship Owners Association. EXA, Dr. Lucas Barbaris, President of Safe Balkers, and Mrs. Harris Plakadonaki, Chief Strategy Officer uh, from uh, Starbucks Carriers. So um, let's start uh, straight uh, with um, the short term measures, uh, the EXI and CII, to be adopted today by MAPC 76 as already mentioned, also in the previous panel discussion. And I'd like to get uh, first uh, the SIP operator's view, uh, starting with Lucas, about uh, what do you think more challenging to achieve and more effective in terms of uh, greenhouse gas reduction up to uh, 2030, EXI or CII? and how you plan to cope with these requirements down the road, and what you would consider as more uh, promising technologies that could retrofit it with reasonable payback uh, period in your existing fleet. So, Lucas. Uh, th thank you, Samati. Uh, it is clear that uh, uh, the EXI is, uh, I mean, uh, is almost a design index which can be achieved uh, uh, through easy means, let's say, for example, through uh, EPL that uh, can reduce uh, energy propulsion. Uh, and, uh, as it is, uh, and as such, uh, it is quite easy to, uh, for many vessels to achieve this, uh, uh, this index. Uh, CII, the Carbon Intensity Index, uh, 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 shows uh, the overall performance over the year of uh, each vessel. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this is more crucial and uh, uh, all vessels will need uh, to face, uh, and certain vessels may need to have difficulties to achieve this, uh, this index. Uh, I tend to think um, in terms of implementation uh, the following generally, uh, most of the ships uh, that are in the market right now are, uh, let's say, up to phase uh, one. 
uh, and uh, they are only a few in phase two or phase and, and basically they're not existing of uh, phase this which will be implemented in 2023 in 2025 uh, and um, most of the ships do not uh, are not cut, uh, cut, uh, classified in a in the in the design index uh, previously because they are older ships. Uh, I tend to believe that uh, generally Japanese ships are being more efficient from uh, in, from their initial construction will be more able to compete and uh, uh, Chinese vessels or Korean vessels being uh, a little bit heavier could uh, face difficulties. Uh, the means to achieve that, I mean, is uh, I mean there are several uh, things that you can do. The most uh, important thing is uh, reduction, and easy thing is the reduction of speed, which uh, reduces the uh, will reduce also the CII. And uh, if you cannot achieve this uh, this uh, required measure by uh, by decreasing the speed, you can have uh, another of axes. You can uh, put certain ducts. You can uh, uh, you can use low friction paints. Uh, fins uh, I mean, and uh, other things like uh, biofuels. You can start burning uh, biofuel in the future. You can, uh, 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 there is uh, air lubrication. Uh, I think there are uh, sub generators, uh, all kinds of, let's say, more simple or, um, uh, or more uh, detailed and uh, expensive measures to adapt. So it depends on the vessel, how old the sea is, uh, and what is uh, the initial design. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Interesting, this uh, relation to the ADI phase and, and the additional effort in order to cope with this requirement. Uh, Philippos, uh, can you give us an overview for your fleet? Uh, yes, thank you, Stamadis. Um, I will start uh, a little bit by the, uh, what we have done as a company. Uh, we early enough uh, created a strategy uh, back in 2012 uh, which gave a clear direction towards a gradual reduction of uh, the carbon foot footprint of our vessels. The first step, step was to sell all the high polluting vessels, measuring, of course, those per ton mile, uh, and not just uh, how, uh, how many, how much uh, uh, fuel they consume. And the second step, step which was critical, uh, it was that we stay being in the design process of our future vessels utilizing the technologies available, but even uh, developing our uh, own tailor-made energy saving devices. And by using uh, the CFDs, uh, we optimize as much as possible our health. Of course, uh, the optimization is not a, simp a simple uh, issue. You need to consider always the operating profile of your, or your ships uh, to set the parameters uh, towards that direction. Um, today, our fleet consists of vessels that uh, already uh, fulfill the phase two, and our recent deliveries even fulfill the phase three, five years earlier than the implementation, like uh, Lucas just mentioned. Uh, of course, by the end date of the implementation of the, uh, of the regulation, uh, we do not need to do anything, but going forward, depending on the final CIIs agreed by the MPC 76, we have to analyze all the KPIs and uh, the relevant uh, ESG metrics and decide accordingly what to do. Uh, basically, uh, our understanding um, is that uh, in the scope of EDI requirement, uh, uh, can uh, use attain EDI calculated in accordance with the EDI guidelines uh, as an alternative to attain EXI without recalculation uh, or recertification. Uh, this is the reason I make this uh, difference, uh, differentiation because our ships, uh, we don't need to do a recalculation or reclassification, uh, recertification at this time. Uh, unless, of course, uh, the attain EDI does not satisfy the, the required EXI at the implementation date. Uh, following, of course, what I already said, uh, there, are, there will be cases uh, as follows. Versus uh, that have already the IE mainly those um, built after 2013 and fulfill the phase two, uh, maybe will not require to do any technical adjustments uh, at least until 2026. But also uh, this is uh, uh, depending on the escalation of the CIIs uh, from 23 to 26. 
Uh, the other category are those vessels that uh, have already an EDI and does not fulfill the phase two, plus all others prior to that period. Uh, well, those they need to follow the XI calculation guidelines uh, to attain uh, the required EXI. Uh, uh, this is uh, how how we see that uh, uh, that, that uh, implementation. Uh, based of course all above, all above I, uh, what I said, and having in mind some uh, preliminary study, uh, studies, uh, including one of our own company, uh, the status of the today vessel, uh, vessels in operation, we see at least in the dryback sector uh, about 50% that are classified phase zero or even below. And about 30% are classified phase one and only the 20% are better than phase two. Therefore, uh, we see that uh, um, uh, most of the vessels uh, likely will install an energy power limitation like uh, Lucas just mentioned. Uh, you know, and this will have a consequence uh, that the speed will be restricted. Uh, it's also important to mention that a calculation uh, uh, based on that study gave some results that uh, there will be a reduction of the transport work along with uh, as much as 15 to 20 percent greenhouse gas reductions, absolute reductions, only based uh, on this implementation. Uh, of the EDI EXI. Uh, depending, of course, on the CIIs, uh, then the emissions reduction will be uh, most li likely uh, gradually increase. Uh, and a certain percentage of the existing fleet with either not be in the position technically to comply or, or will be subject to heavy reductions in revenue uh, versus, uh, of course, the index indexes. Since I mentioned only uh, energy power limitation, which is one of the basic uh, instruments or tools that uh, can be used, I, I have to make also additional uh, some uh, um, uh, some measures that uh, can be taken based also on what Lucas said. There are first the energy saving devices like the pre wire stud or the wake improving duct, the pre shrouded veins. Uh, the propeller and boss cup fins, bulb rudder, twist rudder, and, and may, name it. There are too many uh, of those. But for all these uh, energy saving devices, or uh, the ship owners should follow a very complicated cost process. Uh, that means you do, you have to do the CFTs to estimate the weight flow field, and then you have to select uh, the the design of uh, the device uh, or a combination of uh, one or two devices. You run a, the CFTs again to estimate and calculate what will be the impact. And then you, uh, you have to uh, verify with the model test and on top to validate with the, tri uh, with the C trial. Uh, this is of course a very, very costly um, uh, process. Uh, but in some cases, uh, it's a must, otherwise uh, the, the ships might, might be obsolete. Uh, second, uh, a ship owner must run a study as to the performance of the existing propeller and uh, whether this could be up upgraded by trimming or doing some other additions or even replace it. Uh, it's again a costly um, uh, process, but uh, it's something that uh, some of the owners they are uh, taking into consideration. Uh, the third is what uh, uh, Lucas said uh, about uh, antifouling systems, system, change antifouling system to silicon acrylate technologies or silicon base, which are low friction and they have, um, based on our experience, up to 4% uh, lower uh, emissions. Um, the fourth, uh, but uh, uh, mainly this has to do with the CIIs, are the energy, uh, the energy management systems on board. And I'm, 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 just, I'm telling about the energy recovery systems like kinetic heat or even uh, other ways how to recover energy, uh, the renewable energy sources that might be installed. Uh, installation of power packs uh, to store renewable energy or excess energy produced, uh, which we lacked uh, some cases as peak shavings, some other cases to use it uh, entirely during the, the, the sailing. 
very important LED every, everywhere is a very huge saving and cost uh, uh, simply nothing. Uh, therefore, the decision to be made requires a, a cost-benefit analysis for uh, every investment or on all above, and maybe a combination uh, versus an energy power limitation. Uh, one last point uh, is useful uh, maybe here to mention that there are also some additional measures to be taken, which uh, will help the owners to comply uh, with the escalated CIIs. Uh, and I refer to the augmentative artificial intelligence. Uh, this relates to the usage uh, of deep uh, learning technologies to enhance human intelligence, not to replace, uh, very important, to enhance. And um, uh, this is, uh, these deep learning technologies include, among others, for example, root optimization uh, or predictive maintenance analytics, which are directly related with the consumption and consequently with the greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, um, and also to estimate the health condition, the trimming, and, and a lot of other uh, similar. Uh, as a company, we develop over the last five years uh, deep learning technologies uh, using real-time data uh, from our ships, uh, but also using historical data. And these technologies uh, are now under testing uh, with very promising results. Thank you, Samadis. Thank you, Philippe, <clears throat> for the very comprehensive uh, reply. So I understood you have carried out a good exercise, comprehensive study for the new buildings and existing fleet. And I would like to ask also Harris, uh, is it the CII also your main concern? Uh, and what, uh, what are your plans to cope with this? Thank you, Stamatis. And thank you also to the Capital Link team for inviting me to speak to you today. So, so to answer your question here at Starbuck, uh, we have uh, established an in-house research and development team within our technical department, uh, which deals with all these new uh, IMO greenhouse gas regulations. And in collaboration with one of our classification societies, we have already performed an analysis of all our vessels to assess uh, what is the impact of uh, both EXI and CII measures. Uh, now, uh, as already mentioned by my fellow panelists, CXI is, a, is basically the SIP design index, which indicates the energy efficiency of the SIP, and SIPs will be required to meet a specific uh, EXI as of the date of uh, enforcement. And, and in that sense, CXI uh, will require only a once in a lifetime reduction to meet the IMO target. Uh, and this, of course, for any vessel which is not already in compliance, because there are already energy efficient vessels which are in compliance. Now, now for our fleet, uh, for our vessels that do not already meet the, the IMO targets, our analysis has shown uh, that the most efficient way to comply will be to implement what, uh, what uh, Mr. Barbaris and Mr. Fields have already mentioned, the engine uh, power limitation, which is the process that uh, limits the maximum power of the main engine and, and, and therefore improves the EXI formula. Uh, we already have experience as a company with, uh, with EPL. We have performed this uh, upgrade in the past on, on a few of our vessels within the scope of the right ship uh, greenhouse gas rating. Uh, now, as to any effect the exam we have on our uh, fleet's current speed, during the past years, uh, as a company, we, we have already been uh, trying to optimize speeds as much as possible in order to save on uh, bunker costs. Therefore, um, the reduction in maximum speeds after the, the EPL is performed is not expected to have any major impact on the operating profile of our vessels. Uh, now, now, the CII is a, is a different story because uh, we expect this to be most, uh, more challenging uh, as it will require uh, an annual improvement. It's not an, a one-off reduction like the EXI. Uh, it requires that every year we improve uh, the AER, the annual efficiency ratio of its vessel, uh, which is basically the metric that the IMO has adopted for carbon intensity. Uh, now, now, the AER is, is a carbon intensity uh, metric which uses the the dead weight of the vessel and assumes that the vessel is continuously carrying cargo. Uh, so, so for us to comply with the CII target, we, we are assessing a number of solutions, uh, many of which have already been mentioned by uh, Mr. Phyllis and Mr. Barbaris. Uh, for example, um, uh, same as Mr. Phyllis, we were already uh, piloting a number of uh, latest technology uh, optimization platforms. Uh, we aim to perform through these platforms weather routing, speed optimization, um, how performance monitoring, and, and uh, should we see that these uh, voyage optimization practices are not enough, 
for us to meet the targets. We're, we're also assessing uh, solutions more costly, such as um, uh, having more frequent health cleaning, um, performing more frequent dry docks, using more advanced anti fouling paints, in general practices that um, uh, minimize the impact of hard fouling uh, to the vessels for consumption. Uh, now, at the same time, and as my fellow panelists mentioned, we, we, are, we are also examining existing energy saving devices, for example, muse ducts, but uh, we also participate in scientific programs which assess also new technologies. For example, we have a project on air lubrication, we have a project on uh, uh, propulsion maneuvering devices, uh, uh, for example, the, the gate rudder system. Uh, so for, for EXI, we have opted for a single solution, EPL, while for CII, we are examining a combination of solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Harris. Um, so at this time, we're going to see very interesting, let's say, uh, developments in shipping in terms of retrofitting new technologies. And let's see whether regulations and class rules are in place in order for all this to be smoothly adopted on ships. And uh, Ioannis, if you allow me to continue with you, since I understand you attended MFC 76, right, with Cyprus delegation. And I would like to ask you, what are the important regulatory developments coming from this uh, committee meeting? What are the key takeaways? And what we should expect with regards to YMO 2026 uh, review on EXI and CII coming down the road? Would be, do you think that would be stricter EXI reduction rates or uh, how the reduction rates for CII may, let's say, what we're going to see in the future? Thank you, Stamatis, and uh, good afternoon to all. At first, please allow me to express my appreciation to Nicolas Bornozis for, for once again inviting me to took part as a panelist to this uh, great event, the Limassol Capital Link event. At the same time, I will also express my, my disappointment because we are not in a position to have a physical present because what is uh, really great with the uh, capital link events is, is that you have the opportunity to meet uh, people, colleagues, partners for all, all over the shipping industry. And now go, go back uh, to your question. Actually, MEPC is still in progress. Actually, now we are in the very last day. And actually, now my colleagues uh, uh, are engaging, hopefully, uh, with the adoption of the report. Uh, I'm following the work of MEPC committee since 1996. For almost 25 years. I, I must confess that this one was one of the most hard uh, sessions. Uh, slow development, long intervention, tactics, politics, everything. So what it has been achieved. Actually, in front of us, we have a package. Amendments to Marpol Annex 6, the adoption of the associate guidelines, and the famous impact on states. And this is a package. The easier uh, issue is the uh, adoption of the amendments, because actually we have an agreement coming from MEPC 75. So the, the, the hard part was the agreement on, 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 on the guidelines. And especially the famous G3 guidelines, the draft uh, 2021 guidelines on the operational carbon intensity reductions uh, factors relative to reference lines. At least 19 countries took the floor and express their preferences either to stay the regime as it is now, that means 10% uh, up to, to, to 20 to 25, and then a revision, or to impose specific target for the period 27 uh, to 2030. Uh, the result of that debate was 
absolutely marching. So just for your information, the guideline stays as it is. Cyprus was on the minority size along with other European countries and we express uh, our preference for at least 22% reduction rate. But as already said, we were on the mi minority, minority. The amendments to Marco Annex is, is expected to be adopted later today. There was an agreement on the future work plan for developing mid and long term measures for reducing G in greenhouse gas uh, emissions with the addition, and this is very important, of the obligation to carry out impact assessments to every mid and long term measure. And just to make it clear, we, have, we don't have specific decision, for example, that uh, in the next two or three years, we, for example, we, we are discussing ambient measure. Uh, we have an agreement on the methodology. Uh, we, we support in principle, the need to keep the impact on states under uh, review while highlighting, highlighting that any mechanisms to address the impact of, uh, of measures should be specific and limited to disproportionately negative impact on states, especially on SIDS and LDCs. So we are against of the famous uh, word mechanism because be, 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 be behind those, uh, nice words, the word mechanism, it hides a mechanism not, not to have any additional measure. Now, whether the level of the AXI reduction rate should uh, become stricter, we can say that it is directly connected with the level of ambitions. In case that the level of ambitions becomes stricter, consequently, AXI reduction rate should become so it is highly connected with the revision of the strategy we will we took back on 2023. So my personal impression, there will be, let's say, stricter requirement, but it depends also on the revisions on the, on the actual results about the, uh, the rate of... Uh, of, of, of the reduction of, of emissions. Uh, we support the, sample, the supply based option as the measurement of to 2030 target. I mean, uh, as, uh, as Cyprus. And this was obvious because I have already told you that uh, we are on, 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 the, on the side of the, minor, of the minority because we consider the level of, of ambitions uh, should be ensured in both ways, demand based and supply based, and therefore the mastering edge approach should be chosen. I know that in the panel there is a, a specialist on these issues on EOI and AR, uh, which are related with the uh, mass and supply basis. Philippos, Philip. So if you if you need more more details on that, Philippos is the right person. But it will be also very interesting because as far as I know, and now I'm not playing the, the role of the moderator, DNV uh, has prepared uh, an, uh, an assessment on the impacts on measures on the fleet. And actually uh, you fall, uh, 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 you consider four scenarios, business as usual, EXI only, EXI and CII, with uh, demand base and with supply base, it will be very interest. Uh, if you tell us very brief how it will cost every option. That's uh, all for me. Um, as I told you, that uh, the session in, in, is still in, prog in progress. And for example, if, if the event uh, it was tomorrow, I, I will be in a better position to announce you exactly the results. So for the time being, uh, it's just assumptions. One, one quick question, and thank you very much for, for the update. Uh, have they decided about the implementation date, the entry to four date of the amendments would be 16 yes. months in October or in Yes, yes, 
is still on square bracket, but is November 2022. Okay, thank you, thank you. It's still on yeah. square brackets. That brackets. means it should be decided later today, but uh, I don't expect any... Okay. Eh, eh, eh. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, yes. great. And, and, and one more quick question because the time flies. Um, there, into these uh, Marple amendments, there is one regulation now uh, which encouraging administration, port authorities, and stakeholders to provide incentives to ships rating A or B for according to the CII for the RCI. Uh, any plans from my Cyprus flag on that respect? Uh, providing incentives? This is assist? an excellent co question because, okay, it's a, it, it, my, my answer will not be short, but uh, not uh, more than two minutes, okay? Because for the time being, uh, the Cyprus administration has adopted incentives mm -hmm. and are uh, related uh, with our um, uh, Tony tax system, okay? The incentives are divided into three categories related to technical, operational, and innovative measures for the time being. Technical me uh, measures comparing of the, of the required and, and attain EDI. If you show, for example, uh, more than 10% then gradually, the reduction of tonic uh, tax is increasing. We have an, uh, an incentive related with the data collection system, actually with the uh, fuel consumption. So if you can uh, prove that in two consecutive years, uh, uh, you decrease uh, your fuel consumption, then uh, we provide uh, uh, reductions on, on what uh, ships pay to our uh, tonnage tax system. And also uh, we rewarded those that they showed to us innovation. That means they use uh, alternative fuel. So from, from this production is quite obvious that uh, when the new regulations came into force and because uh, my our schemes of, of incentives a living document will will amend it in, in order to reflect uh, the new development. So our intention is to reward those uh, showing reductions both both at uh, CII and EEXI. So uh, be ready in a couple of years when the regulation will come into force, we will uh, adapt our uh, uh, incentive schemes to meet the new requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. And uh, let's move now to the meter measures. And I would like to have a short feedback from Lucas because we are running out of time. Uh, the, the, now in IMO we had some uh, proposals for a levy and emission capital trading, the carbon credit trading and fleet averaging. So there are additional measures coming down the road. And I would like to ask Lucas, what, what is your opinion about what would be considered an effective meter market measurement? market-based measure from a SIP operator's point of view. And especially this fleet averaging scheme, how, how, what is your opinion on this? I, I think that um, this, uh, uh, these measures should play a role uh, to assist uh, the, the owners uh, in terms of implementation of uh, these new technologies. And, uh, I was considering that, uh, for example, averaging, averaging could be something that uh, would provide assistance if you want to do an investment on, a, let's say, an LNG ship, for example, which will have uh, maybe by 18% lower emissions. Um, then uh, this could be uh, averaged with uh, another older ship that uh, normally should be scrapped I don't know if it will work like that, and uh, I would consider that uh, this could be one uh, good option for companies to invest uh, in new technologies. Of course, there are always questions about uh, uh, LNGs. Uh, uh, if you need to, if you want to uh, invest in such ships, because LNG is not considered uh, uh, from well to wake uh, the best uh, fuel. And my comment on that is that uh, at the end of the day. 
the LNG is used in all industries uh, and uh, they don't consider it uh, from well to wake. For example, the production of electricity, uh, they use in households everywhere, uh, we use LNG. So it shouldn't be the uh, shipping only that uh, should exclude that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, and I believe also that there are technologies to reduce the the sleep, uh, the, the LNG slippage from uh, uh, methane. The, the methane slip, as they call it. Uh, so I see that uh, LNG should be one uh, as an intermediate um, fuel, for example, for a, for a couple of uh, 10 to 15 years until we manage to produce uh, the normal fuels, uh, the normal re uh, fuels from re renewable resources, not from uh, other resources that's, such as ammonia or hydrogen. And I believe ammonia will prevail. And uh, so in order to do that, you need certain measures to be assisted in, in investing in, in, in such ships. Uh, I, I also believe that um, uh, wherever, wherever we like it or not, uh, the, uh, the regulators will uh, impose uh, levies and taxation schemes uh, because uh, we, we all know that uh, the world is going to a specific direction and we need to be supportive on this direction. We cannot leave uh, uh, the planet to, to be overheated. So at the end of the day, uh, such schemes will uh, be developed, will be implemented. If IMO takes take part on these ships, uh, it will uh, or be a follower. Uh, it could also be a follower, uh, following, let's say, decisions by EU or United States or other, uh, let's say, countries. Uh, and uh, uh, I think at the end of the day, we need to be very careful and try to improve our uh, efficiency because uh, one way or the other, the, the low the low efficiency vessels uh, the companies that have low efficiency vessels will be in a disadvantage operational and uh, financial disadvantage so this is my view about uh, taxation schemes and uh, averaging of uh, uh, fleets thank you thank you very much uh, luca and with this your last uh, comment about I'm being a follower of EU, um, I would like to ask uh, Philippos, who understands um, follow-ups closely the development in EU. Uh, just of, we need we know that there will be the fit for 55 legislative package expected in 17 of July. And I would like to ask his opinion about these regional me measures coming from Europe, what we should expect and when, and, uh, and the emission trading scheme, etc., and are in the right direction, or Europe should leave IMO alone to coordinate the decarbonization efforts on a global scale. Philippos. I uh, think, thank you, Stamadis. I don't know how much time I have, uh, but uh, uh, I will start first by the 22% that mentioned by uh, by Annis uh, that uh, the European European countries they were assisting for the CIIs. And good thing we have 11%. 20% 20 should have been detrimental for the industry. This shows how tough is Europe. We are, uh, there is already published a climate package of uh, Executive Vice President um, Franz Timmermans, who is responsible actually for the 55. 55, uh, it doesn't mean 55 new regulations, means 55% reduction by 2030. Uh, this is a signal they, they leave out. I will elaborate only on, the, on two major uh, uh, measures because I, I don't believe we have the time for more. The first is the UTS, which comes from DG Climate, and the excess position. And I, I have to say that I'm, uh, I'm uh, talking now as a representative of EXA, uh, trying to uh, give uh, what is the position of EXA and the European Shipwonders Associations in, in any way. Uh, the position was always to be aligned, uh, fully aligned with ICS first, uh, and uh, to uh, follow. Uh, support the discussion within IMO for a new market-based measure. We, we heard a little bit that uh, the talks are not to those di directions so far. Uh, specifically, uh, EXA has on EU ETS uh, several considerations. First of all, uh, 
uh, we develop our position through a framework document, framework conditions, under which any EU measures should not undermine the IMO process and that the system should be scalable and able to align with the future IMO, uh, IMO MBM, hopefully the levy. This can only be achieved within ETS if we apply, if we are setting up a fund. And I will elaborate a bit on the rationale for creating a fund. First, can stabilize the carbon price for shipping and give visibility and predictability to the owners. The second, uh, can significantly reduce the administrative burden for both competent authorities and the businesses, and in particular the SMEs. And you know, 80% of the European shipping is, uh, are SMEs. Also, a fund uh, will be responsible to purchase the ETS allowances on behalf uh, of uh, its members and would reinvest this money uh, in the energy transition uh, of the sector. Uh, our opinion is that all revenues from any system should have to flow into the R&D innovation projects, uh, especially for development of low and zero carbon fuels and uh, new production technologies. Uh, the revenues also, which is very, very important to uh, mention that, should be used also to bridge the gap between the conventional and low, uh, low and zero carbon fuels with the, um, uh, uh, which might be uh, substantial. Uh, the estimated price is uh, all multiple is uh, three times at this moment. So uh, you, if you don't bridge this gap, so you will not have early movers in, towards that direction. Another critical point is the introduction of a, a, a phase-in period, uh, where this phase-in period will be used, uh, first of all, to <laughs> that the system will cover uh, part of these emissions uh, of this uh, 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 money, for example, and gradually to increase to 100%. And, and also, this will uh, will uh, allow the participant to learn and the regulators to identify potential errors, especially in bugs, especially such uh, a, a, a full electronic system. Going now a little bit to the fuel uh, EU maritime proposal, from uh, which comes from DigiMove. And as far as we know now, there is a clash between DigiMove and, and DigiClimate because uh, they are conflicting a little bit. Exxon believes that a fuel standard as a requirement for ships instead of the fuel suppliers will risk failing to deliver on emissions reductions and will be very challenging to enforce. What is needed uh, is a comprehensive approach and tailing a fuel standard as a requirement for fuel suppliers, or eventual an efficient standard at a fleet level to incentivize further technical and operational efficiency measures. Fleet level is measured also by Lugas on a different perspective, but it works the same way. In this respect, we would like to stress uh, excess concerns and in parallel the positions uh, in relation to this uh, uh, regulation. A mandatory fuel standard would eventually, would eventually apply to fuels purchased outside the EU, making ships the responsible entity for meeting the standard when the ship owners have no influence at all. And then a standard for these fuels purchased international uh, would, in essence, mandate uh, the use uh, maybe of biofuels by ships and due to lack of any alternative fuels. And uh, this relates especially to the deep sea uh, shipping. Uh, an independent study uh, commission uh, jointly EXA and ICS finds that uh, there are several outstanding issues concerning first the cost, then the availability and the specifications of the biofuels, fuels, uh, as well as uh, important questions about enforcement uh, uh, relating to EU sust uh, sustainability criteria under the other direction, which is the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, therefore, uh, all these uh, enforcement uh, loopholes, uh, we are sure that may jeopardize the achievement of, of actual emissions reductions. Additionally, by certifying please, EU please, fuels... Please forgive me for the interruption. Yeah. We are running out of time. The time is fly, so please well, well, we need to. Late, so if you can wrap up, I would be grateful. Yes. Okay, I will. Uh, shall I close it? Uh, leaving the other. Uh, 
Okay, to summarize, uh, main findings of the studies first that there are significant challenges for enforcing the EU uh, fuel, fuel standards, uh, especially of fuels outside the EU jurisdiction through uh, the operators, etc. And uh, the second important is that uh, uh, we believe uh, that uh, they, they rec this request or this implementation should limit the scope only to intra-EU uh, voyages and assign the responsibility to, your, to the fuel suppliers. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe, and thank you, Nicola. Apologies for the additional no, no time. Worries. No worries. I apologize for bringing it to a quick close. Uh, it has been a great panel. Forgive me that we have to run to the next one. Uh, thank you all very much, and Philippe, thank you for a very thorough and, of course, detailed uh, and well-argumented uh, insight, and all of you. Thank, thank you thank for you. inviting us, Nicolas. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and thank you very, very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.